Let me ask you though about racism. Do you, as you travel through this world, as you travel through America, feel the burn of hatred? Um, you've spoken about the revolutions that have been fought throughout the 20th century mm -hmm. against racism. Mm -hmm. But today, as people talk about educating, reminding the world with uh, even with more philosophical ideas of critical race theory, for example, do you think this is still a battle that, that needs to be fought at the forefront of culture in, in the United States? Um, does racism exist? Yes, it does. But all forms of isms exist. Some people, it's about various forms of ableism. Others, it's about size. Um, and racism, yes, is one of them. Does it exist? Yes, it does. But is it what's going to stop anyone from manifesting their greatest potential? I say no. I say no. Many people in this country have showed it. Whether they're African-Americans or African, African immigrant, I'm an African immigrant. You have African-Americans like Oprah and others, and other people even before her, who, despite the nastiness around them, were able to make it. So we do know, especially as Black people, but I think it's humanity as a whole. And that's what I love about the human spirit. It's resiliency. But resiliency only can happen if you don't allow yourself to be beaten down and to lose your, your self of agency. It's, of course, easier said than, than done. And some among us need a little bit more help to not succumb for it than others do. And I've seen it. It, it might be harder for you if you're somewhere in a, you know, um, in a city um, you know, inner city Black America. Maybe the environment might be a little bit tougher um, for you to try and get your act together and all of that stuff. And it's okay. But even in that situation, we need to, um, I think it's important that we still do not rob you of your agency. And this is where I am mad as heck against those who supposedly um, care and their idea of how to make sure that I don't become or stay a victim of racism is through all the things we talked about, the CRT, the anti-racism crap of, um, you know, uh, Abraham X. Kendi and what's her name? D Robin D'Angelo. I mean, her, I'm, I'm shocked. The woman is making all of this money, supposedly fighting a war on our behalf. I'm like, lady, I hear you loud and clear that you are a true racist. I know, but you told me you are. Mm. And for you to think that your anti-racism makes you less racist, and it's, that happens too. She's, she, she comes from a racist background. Fine, she's saying it. It's true. But this idea that every walking person on earth belongs to one category or the other, depending on what you, you know, which skin color you came with, it's, it's, it's problematic at its root. So my point is, does racism exist? Yes. Do you think it's going to stop me from doing anything I have to do? No. Might it make it harder, longer? Maybe. But it will not stop me. But for it not to stop me, I can't engage in victimhood mentality. I can't lose myself or self. I, I, got, I got to use all the agency that I have to fight back and fight beyond. See? It's just some juice, but fight back. You fight back and you fight beyond. Because at some point, yeah, and. It's this concept of yes, and. So um, this is why I have loved the job. So when I have somebody who is like, oh, anti-racism is the way. Uh, we're going to go and tell all the, black, uh, all the white kids that, you know, because they were, happen to be white, that they're really the oppressors and blah, blah, blah. And the black kids, because they're black, you know. You're not changing anything when you're doing that. Nothing except that you're, causing, you're putting problems where, where there were no problems to start with. All we had to do was maybe go for a different route from there. Kids are kids. Kids are born kids. And this, I'm not sure if you want to get me going on to the whole science of um, bias, because that's something I spent years of my life on. And my journey 
on the science of bias started with um, the days of Philando Castile, Eric Garner, that whole summer of 2016, when we had this horrendous, horrendous uh, situation of Black people kill, um, being killed by the police, where they shot before asking, and people left to die in the most inhumane way for the rest of us to watch from the social media. That's me. That's when my George Floyd moment happened. Not later, four years ago, and the whole world is like, you know. Um, so that sent me on a journey of uh, understanding what discrimination is and bias is. Um, and in a way, that's the reason why I started this company that I even called Skin is Skin. That's where it came from. Again, criticized by creating. I, I, I needed to understand what discrimination was. How does it work? Is it true what Candy is saying? Is it true what D'Angelo is saying? Is it true that, that I, it, could, it could be that you're, ba you're, you're, you're racist just because of the skin color you happen to be born in? Is it true? Is it true? I, I needed to know because I was at a time of my life where at some point, you know, when, the, when those killings were happening, it was so hard for me um, being a black person in this country and wondering I mean, what is this? And and what do we do with this? Um Yeah, is it true how much discrimination am I operating under in the system? All of that. And uh, you need to understand the full characteristics of if you're if you're dreaming of making a big change by building companies, you have to kind of into it, how much, what am I up against? What am I up against, right? And so this is why, you know, spend all of this time on some of the work. And then eventually I understood that um, discrimination, if you wanted to understand it beyond, um, it's, um, you know, beyond the, the big lines of, uh, especially the, the clickbait lines would make it very black and white. Then I had to really take a moment and I spent time, you know, with a world of um, brain scientists, with uh, behavioral psychologists, uh, with uh, evolutionary biologists. So you have all of this ecosystem, but together form what we one might call the science of bias. And especially, I came across the work of this team of scientists at the University of, uh, I think it's Wisconsin, and they're the only ones who made sense in this sea of nonsense back then. And uh, this article was in Politico, and it was saying something that I could relate with. And eventually, what I learned was, and this part comes from the evolutionary biologist people, they, in a way, tell you that right around age three, it can happen sooner or later because, you know, we're all different, but um, you go from this person who has to rely on these other people, usually your parents, to stay alive, to be fed, to be housed, to be even your diaper change, all of that stuff, right? To now, something is kicking in where you have to, in order for you to survive, and this is all wired in, so you don't even understand it consciously as I'm saying it now, where in order for you to survive, for, in order for you to go from this state of dependency to, another, to, the next state, to the next stage and more and more and more, you're going to have to develop this ability to make sense of the world. And what's making sense of the world at its most basic level means is can you determine if a situation or a person is good or bad for you? Failure, and you need to be able to do so, do so ever so quickly. Because failure to, do, to be able to do that might, means that you might not be alive the next second. See, it's so wired in. So this process is starting to kick in. And at that point, your brain is going to be your best ally for that. And what the brain is going to do is it's going to help you. And the way the brain works is through, um, it, 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 it works with, um, for if, it's all wired for efficiency. And the way it, um, it goes for efficiency is through automation. Meaning that every time it has computed, and you probably know these things way better than me, every time it has computed one algorithm, it doesn't, try to, it, it doesn't want to do it again. It's almost like this, okay, got it, stored stored, right? And then it adds maybe some little of levels of complexity to it, but it has to be something new, meaning the new level of complexity for it to even be willing to reconsider. Otherwise you have, so then all of a sudden what you have is these neurons in the back of your head and they have created pathways, right? So, and every time um, neurons have created pathway among themselves, 
because basically they're attached. And here is a pathway. Well, this pathway in the world of um, the in the world of um, bias, science of bias, it's a habit. In, in general, it's a habit when they form two pathways. When they form a pathway, it's a habit. So, if we're willing to talk about unconscious bias, because of course it's very different from somebody who tells me to my face. There's no world in which you or I could ever be equal because you're black and I'm white. You're a woman, I'm a man, this, this, and that. That People like that, again, 1% 1 of psychopaths in our world, they're out there. Unfortunately, by the time they do nasty things, it's pretty horrible, and that's what all we hear about. But I'm talking mostly about the rest of us. Remember when I told you that most of us are good people, bumbling along, making it up as we're going. Yeah. And that's why I have compassion for human nature. Mm -hmm. So, but really, in the morning when I wake up, do you really think that I'm waking up and thinking, how am I going to go kill? How am I going to go kill Lex? That Lex guy needs to yeah. go down. He's a man. He's a... Don't take me wrong. I'm sure there are some women who feel like that, but mm -hmm. I'm not one of them. And I do think a majority of us are not whatever. But you know, in the morning I'm waking up, I'm just like, gee, can I get my tea? Oh, my dog is not looking okay today. You know, we've got... Yeah. <laughs> right? There's <laughs> a lot going on and so you're using these kind of just like you said brilliantly the brain is has a bunch of simplifications that's built up yeah. and and he uses those simplifications to get through the to day to get through the day <laughs> exactly so so then here you are needing to make sense of a world and then the brain is your best ally in that. The way it's going to do it is for efficiency. Efficiency done through automation. So every time it thinks it's figured something out, it's never going to think about it again. So that's how you build all of these habits of unconscious bias. Because everything, so it's somewhere along the line, you come up with um, the, with, uh, the information that black man walking around with a hoodie equals danger. Mm -hmm. So later, what do you see? Whether it's Lex or Magat, I'm walking in the dark alley. I see a black man with a hoodie. Maybe I'm going to run away because I've been given that information. So the best way to think about it is the brain is a hardware and, uh, and the software it runs on is, um, what do you call it? Is a cultural imprint. Mm -hmm. All of this information that we're getting from the Disney movies that you're reading, telling you that damsels are to be saved by the prince and all of that stuff and girls wear pink and all whatever. Um, you know, you watch the movies and all the movies, whenever you watch them, it's about Africa. They're talking to you about the blood diamonds or they're talking to you about slavery or they're talking to you about this. And then no wonder you walk away thinking that all the ills of Africa are caused because of uh, resource extraction, the diamonds, or they're always fighting each other. Look at uh, Idi Amin and the movie, you know, or, you know, uh, slavery all the time. You walk away and this is it. And we all programmed along the same line. See, that's the beauty of it. All of us are. Because even some black people who are going to claim that they didn't, this is not what they registered, really? So the truth, so then when I learned all of this, I'm like, wow, this concept of if you've got the brain, you've got biases, it comes with a territory, that makes sense. Now, it doesn't mean we can't, we can't transcend that function of a brain and that we should transcend it, right? But I think it's very important because once you understand that, a little bit more peace is cre created among us. Because this is not about a black and white or a yellow and green issue. It's about we are human issue. And these are part of the things we develop to, you know, to, 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 keep, to, to stay around. Um, just like we no longer have to rely on, um, you know, this fear of flight, um, you know, like um, ability of a brain. Because bears over there start running and running fast, right? Today, where are the bears? Show me where they are. But we have kept this tendency to go for fear, uh, fear of flight. I don't know how they say it. And so we have this, you know, cortisol done by the stress, you know, stress triggers that back in the days we have a stress trigger, we run and it's all, you know, expelled out. But today we get triggers and we don't know what to do with it because where do we run to? What do we do? The, 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 bear, the bear is not even here. So same thing here with that. And so then you realize there's this whole thing that is now we what you understand is that this problem is not about anti-racism BS, but it is about can each one of us do the work where the work is needed, which is we look inside. Can we go for this work of deprogrammation, this concept of a mindful practice of undoing the habit of bias? And that doesn't necessarily have to do with a simple categorization of black and white. It's all kinds of biases. It's about everything. It's about everything. And you know, when I started on that journey, 
And um, me and my friend back then built, you know, this practice of undoing your habit of unconscious bias. We had all types of people come and say, wow, I discovered that my bias is against larger people. And I'm, I'm like, what, what do you mean? Well, um, I think I, it seems to me like I felt that larger people maybe are, are dumb. Mm-hmm. No, we heard things. And you know, and you don't judge. Yeah. You don't judge. And so, and you see, it's at every level, you know, like, um, I don't know, like there's even this one friend, she was like, you know, when I looked into the whole dating thing, I absolutely didn't want to have, um, you know, date the Asian men because she went, her mind was into some stereotypes about the size of whatever. And she was like, no, but you see, you once you start, because there's this whole thing of, um, it's the five-step thing, bias awareness, this, uh, underst- basically at this level, what you're doing is you're learning to spot the biases in our culture because that's where the cultural imprint comes from. You're watching this movie and you're realizing, just like I said, wow, gee, I realized once again, the black person is portrayed like uh, like the fuck of a movie. Um, or, you know, um, the Latina lady, this is how she's been portrayed. And you're seeing it everywhere, even the NPR. NPR is happening, like you're listening to something like NPR. You gotta be more liberal than that. And this gentleman is asking these two candidates, one of them is a woman, political candidates, the other one is a man. I'm hearing ask, him asking the lady a question that I know he's not going to ask the man, and he didn't ask her. He said, "How do you um how do you balance uh, uh you know your race with a family? Yeah. Does the man not have a family? Right there, you see, it's very subtle. Yeah. But you see, but because now my mind is kind of trained to see things, I'm like, hmm, interesting. Or like when the media just says, throws um climate change." issue on something Mm -hmm. without even the choice of words. So it's pretty much everywhere. You open a book everywhere. The interesting thing though, um, I mean, even that man, uh, woman example is I think it's really um, powerful to bring that bias to the surface, but not let that lead to kind of fear and paralysis. That's right. You should almost, I mean, that's where humor is. Make fun of it, bring it to the surface. Like acknowledge the fact that those things are a part of the conversation. And a lot of them are, it is, you know, it's a cultural imprint because it's part of culture. And that might be, there could be, you know, I grew up in the in the Soviet Union where the gender roles were stronger mm-hmm. than in other places. That's right. And that's part of the culture. We have to acknowledge exactly. that, that this is how, this is affecting how I think. You might, exactly. we might like how that works or we might not, but we have to acknowledge it and, and not get, you know, make it part of humor, make fun of yourself, you know, all that kind of stuff. That That's the thing. And yeah. so Lex, that's why this first step is bias, um, bias awareness. So you get, you train yourself. Oh yeah. Okay. That was one. Or it's, whatever, you know, and it's about, it's in you. It's, we're talking mm-hmm. about you. We're not. And then from there, you're like, um, um, replace the bias, like bias replacement. V- then it is, um, where you practice the empathy, you're like, gee, wow, I wonder how I would feel every day I walk into a store exactly. and the guy thinks he should be following me because maybe I can, st- I might steal something because I'm black, right? Because when once you try that to put yourself in the other person's shoes, all of a sudden something else starts to click. And then from there, you go on to making connection. Then you're making a connection and then things start to change because now you, um, no, you're making, um, then you make cultural immersion. So this is where we had some people, like this one woman, she was very, um, uh, quite, uh, very feminist oriented. And um, she had an issue with women wearing the the hijab. Mm -hmm. And because for her, it was like, how come you, how come, how come you, you, you you just lower, you know, like, how come you're accepting this uh, demeaning of yourself, not understanding everything else that comes with it. But through, as she understood that she even had that bias, then she went on through all the different processes. And then eventually, when comes the next step, cultural immersion, she started going uh, to the mosque during uh, Ramadan when the Muslims are doing, you know, their, uh, their, it's the holy month of, um, you know, fasting and then we break uh, at night. And uh, she started understanding very different things. And eventually happens the last step that happens naturally, making a true, real, genuine connection. And this is where friendships happen. This is where that's it. Your bias can go home now because it has been challenged with reality and understanding. And so for me, that is what I was after. And then, but then the world was just like, we don't want to be told we're part of a problem. 
So, but I still reckon that it is the type of mindfulness type of practice that's going to need to happen. And it's one that's very internal to, to, to you. It is, it is not, and it happens everybody at their own pace. So all of this, I take it back to, um, to the racism, the question you were asking me. Does racism exist? Yes, it does. Is it going to stop me from doing anything I want to do? No. Is it going to make it harder? Maybe. But this is where for anybody who is serious about making sure, uh, about fighting racism, I think the only job you have to do is to make sure that people keep their sense of self-agency and B, can you help provide people with the tools to stand up? So this is why I have so much respect for Van Jones. Uh, people like Van Jones, although I disagree with him on so many things, but people like um, Miss Alice uh, Johnson, she was pardoned uh, by President Trump through the work of people like Van Jones and uh, Kim Kardashian and others. They all joined forces. This is a case where people of, and, and those folks then went on to combine forces. M furthermore, the, no, no, no regard given to their political belongings. They said, if the issue is crim um, criminal justice reform, then anybody who stands for it has to come together. And so what they did in this situation with, um, uh, with um, what they're doing, criminal justice reform in my mind, is a valid uh, action to fight um, racism in my mind. Because what are you doing there? You're trying to get people out of jail who really have no business being there. And also when you have people like Bishop Omar and the people, uh, he passed away unfortunately, but today we have Anton Lucky, Anton Lucky who was in jail for having killed his um, cousin. You know, he... Um, had started, I think he started the 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 the, the gang in uh, South uh, Dallas. So we're talking really tough guy who was really the wrong side of um, of the equation. And then in 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 jail, literally, he found Plato, the cave, and all of that. So today, these people, we, I'm like, why don't we hear more about them, the urban specialists? Because these people, it's not about the anti-racism crap of Candy or D'Angelo. I'll say it again until the cows come home. But it is about we go where help is needed. We go in urb we go in um, in urban you know um, inner city inner city uh, black inner city neighborhoods and block by block we change the culture mm -hmm. and they say it like that it's their words these are African American people who have as many rights as anybody else to talk about their own culture and they will tell you we have to change the culture I have some some videos like that on my YouTube with um, Bishop Omar. What these people are doing is what we need to do. Bishop will explain and he says sometimes people are. Their, their feet and feet deep down in the mud. And what we have to do is to try to pull them up. And you cannot say you didn't pull them up because we're not seeing their head out yet. But how much, how much progress have they made from the bottom to where they are now? And keep going. So what I see these people doing, you see, I have so much... I, I, I love and respect Glenn Lowry and company, you know, and Ian Rove and all of those guys. I, I love them. I, I love a lot of the things that they say. Um, you know, this whole concept of personal responsibility and all of that. But I'm just like, at some point, it also needs to be matched up with real actions. Yeah. And that's what the people like Anton Lucky, Urban Specialist, um, Alice Johnson are doing. They're going where it's hard. Alice Johnson is getting people out of jail every single day, literally. And then people like Anton Lucky and his team are giving them the tools to leave the gang life, to, to be better people, to go for a life of redemption. This is happening right now. But what I find is they're not getting the bulk of the attention. Yeah. But this is, anybody who's serious about, this is why how I would love to see people do anti-racism, is help lift people up for real. Action. Support, yeah. support. Um, a uh, school choice support school choice black mamas are they know what's going on and when they tell you we want school choice they know what they talk about they're not idiots yeah Give especially them at the local level yes helping help them, them at the local level yes so help them make sure that they can take their kids out of these public schools that are doing horrendous things to them you know miss virginia watch that movie how could you not support 
black moms in this country to take their kids to safety when it comes to education. How come not? That's what I want to see happen. And not like some, yeah, let's go to some classrooms and everybody's white. You go over here. Everybody's an extant. You go over here. And kids, let us tell you about this. No, 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 no. As a black person, I don't want you to do any of that crap. Let me grow my wings. Yeah. If you want, help put some fuel behind them and let me take my flight. That's all I'm asking for. That's the only way for you to do um, a for that's the only way for you to be part of a racism battle if that's what you think is the most important battle of our life. That's it. That's what I have to say about that. And so for me, I'm keeping my head very straight. It's about what uh, enables black people to thrive. I don't need for you to be an activist on my behalf. No, because when you're doing that, you're doing exactly what you've been doing to us black people in Africa our whole life. I don't need your white savior complex because that's what anti-racism is, white savior complex. That stuff doesn't work. It only works to make you feel better about how superior you are to me. But it does nothing, absolutely nothing to change my everyday life. If it is, not, if it is at least in the African side, to actually even change my, um, you know, turn me into somebody who's waiting for handouts. So if peop- I would encourage people to really, those people who are really serious, about wanting to be part of a solution. And I know there are many out there. For the love of God and everything that's out there and you care about, stop. It, it, it's it's about, think about what's gonna um, um, enable people. Maybe the word is wrongly chosen, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, giving them the Give freedom people the, yes. to spread their wings. Yes, give a person, um, <laughs> yeah, learn to teach a person how to fish and don't give them a fish. <laughs> when you're putting your stupid signs on the lawn, uh, with Black Lives Matter and all that crap, yeah. you're not helping. And when you're buying one more anti-racism book or, or, or um, as a company, you know, financing one more DEI, you know, um, if it's done along those lines, I think we've got a problem. Yeah. So you do think that the, um, the efforts of uh, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion, inclusion are often not effective? Not only are they not effective, but they also backfire. And there are reports on all of this. And at the end of the day, it makes sense. It makes sense. So for me, I am very, very glad that people um, have developed an enlightenment about this. Very happy about that. Very. But let us not keep going for the easy perceived solution to problems. Again, they've done this to us, the poor people of Africa. They thought the solution was to give it does not work. And then they say, oh, we're going to do a, a social, uh, social, um, social entrepreneurship on you. Tom Shoes, buy one pair of shoes and we give one pair of shoes to some people in, uh, in poor countries. Then guess what happened to us? You know, in the town where we operate in Senegal, where I have my little manufacturing, two, mm, we have 2,000 little mom and pop businesses. And guess what they happen to be in, Lex? Shoemakers. Right? So you have these shoemakers, each one of them hires at least five, 15 people. Do the math. Family businesses. Guess what happens to them the day the Tom Shoes truck shows up with a bunch of free shoes? Yeah. Who can, who, can, who can compete against free? Now, all of these people, little by little, are going to have to close their shops because who can compete against free? Because Tom Shoes dumping all of his shoes on them. Yeah. And then they go out of business and now... Instead of helping anybody, you actually sent all the kids who depended on these adults working in these places. Now they have to join the rank of kids who need to be given shoes because you took their parents' ability to make money through their wages, buy them shoes. You see, so first they said, we just have to give. So that was um, primarily, um, you know, the charity business. And... Um, you still have foreign aid business going on. So we just need to give. And then the social entrepreneurs came in place. But I'm like, the only person for this is business is good is for Blake McCarthy, you know, the founder of Tom Shoes. But other than that, I'm not sure, I'm really seeing who else is winning from this. And then they, and, and so today, my whole thing is, we got a challenge to have a mind for the poor or to have a mind for the lesser fortunate, maybe in this country. It is easy. 
and less unfortunate maybe was, you know, for anybody that you see, you you feel like is being trampled upon because of something. Maybe it's because of economic circumstances or maybe it's race in this case or whatever. To have a heart for the lesser fortunate among us for whatever reason, that's easy. But to have a mind for them, that's a challenge. <laughs>